Um, so, I, my name is Sarita, I'm a volunteer with Mila Cayo, and I have the honor of introducing our next guest. So, who we have next here is Shema Hernandez Gil, who is also with Mila Cayot, and he is a community organizer who works with low-income communities of color in San Francisco to make biking, walking, and transit safer and more accessible in their neighborhoods. Access to affordable, active transportation being a key part of a community's health and autonomy. Chema was raised vegetarian and experienced his family's shift to eating more dairy and processed foods when they left Mexico. Over the years, he also saw how diets in Mexico changed in similar ways. He will speak about the colonization of native North American food systems and about building vegan agroecological food systems in the context of an anti-colonization or decolonization approach. Uh, so thank you, Chema, for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, so, as she mentioned, my name is uh, Chema Hernandez Gill. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, you actually will hear a lot about my background uh, in, in this uh, presentation, mostly because I'll try to refer back to my history and the history of my uh, family uh, to give a quick survey of the situation as it stands here in North America. But uh, I came to the United States, or I should say I left Mexico when I was uh, 10 years old I come from a small town, now it's a middle-sized town in Mexico called, by coincidence, also San Francisco. Uh, what I tell folks is that there are only so many saints, so inevitably you end up having a lot of uh, duplication. Um, but uh, something that's very interesting about my San Francisco is uh, that there has been a long history of people coming into the United States and leaving the United States. Uh, as far as I can tell, my great-great-grandfather had already been making the move of uh, coming to Texas, actually going to Texas and then going back to San Francisco, all the way up to my grandparents and my father. Uh, my father first came to the United States, hidden in the trunk of a car in the uh, late 70s, early 70s, maybe late 60s, to go work at a tortilleria in LA with his cousins. Uh, didn't like it, went back to Mexico after about six months. But um, it, it highlights the, the deep relationship that exists between the United States and Mexico, and, and ultimately how our economies and, and our co communities are connected, and, and how that impacts, of course, our food systems. So uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the situation before 1521. So I choose 1521 as the turning point because that is the fall of the Triple Alliance, what people call uh, the Aztec Empire. Uh, the relationship that my town has with uh, the Triple Alliance is very interesting. Um, my family, my town was founded as a Republic of Indians uh, during the colonial period. Uh, it was mostly founded by folks who had been traditional enemies of the Triple Alliance, uh, mostly folks from uh, uh, Querétaro, uh, if you know Querétaro, the Otomi Empires, and the Tlaxcalan empires. So th this is going way back, but to us in Mexico, when we talk about these things, it, it, it's as clear to us when we study history as talking about the Holy Roman Empire or the Roman Empire, right? So th these are, are very important institutions that lasted for hundreds of years, but, but that ultimately impacted greatly what's going on in Mexico today. Now, what's very important about this is that uh, I need you to think of these as states. Uh, because they were states. The, the, um, what's interesting is that some of the densest, most populated areas in the world were in Mesoamerica. And, and what that means is that they had a very adequate and a very efficient way of growing food. And here I, ha I put a picture of uh, milpas and chinampas. Milpas are um, what you would call basically today a permaculture cornfield. It's the three sisters, if you're familiar with it. I'll talk about it more later. But um, there are systems basically that allow growing of food over uh, dozens if not hundreds of years. The chinampas are basically the floating gardens that you still have in parts of Mexico, around Mexico City. These are systems that are very efficient and ultimately plant-based. Something that's very important for people to understand and to remember is that North America, aside from the dog, did not really have domesticated animals. That means that the cow, the goat, the sheep, uh, they all came with the Europeans and weren't really adopted 
by uh, Native folks until very, very late in the colonial period, right? So um, the, the, uh, the other panelist who was uh, unfortunately had to cancel, her uh, goal is to talk about indigenous veganism. Now, it, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer because people weren't vegan back then in the sense that they thought that it wasn't good to eat meat, although there were certain prohibitions about eating meat if you were a child. They thought that eating meat was not a good thing for a child to, to eat, that it was something uh, energetically negative, right? But ultimately, their diets were fundamentally uh, plant-based, and um, that's the way it was until relatively recently. What happens in uh, 1521 is, of course, the fall of uh, the Aztec Empire, and then that leads to this short history of capitalism in Mexico. Uh, for those of you that might know, capitalism, ultimately, the root word of it comes from cattle, right? And in Mexico, without cattle, you didn't really have capitalism in the sense that we have it out in the Western world today. Uh, there wasn't, uh, the, there wasn't uh, the use of money. There, there was, it, it, that's not to say it was utopic, far from it. There was tributary systems and, and uh, slavery, but there wasn't capitalism in the same way that we understand it today. So, as I mentioned, Mesoamerica, the densest populated area in the world at around that time, the diseases came and depopulated it, but ultimately we have the MIPA, the corn, the beans, and the squash, really working together to create this whole system. Now, um, I talk about my San Francisco, what I always tell folks is that it's closer than you might think, right? It's uh, closer than New Orleans, right? Walking to San Francisco, to my San Francisco, takes about 60 days, right? A very manageable distance uh, today. And even back then, when you think that all the transport was done by foot, there was deep communications between North America, the Pueblo people, the Hopi people. They were coming up and down uh, Mesoamerica. But that's to give a bit of an idea where the two San Francisco's are. So I talk about the Republic of Indians. Uh, what's very important here to understand also is that the Republic of Indians were essentially an apartheid system that existed throughout Mesoamerica for close to uh, 300 years, from the early 1500s all the way up to the early 1800s. These systems really allowed, it, allowed a certain level of autonomy with Indian groups. Right in the case of uh, my town, uh, well through the the 1810s, 1815, um, and it also meant that people were able to maintain a large level of their traditions, particularly their plant-based food systems. And uh, that brings me to the next picture. The traditional food systems were also very important. This is a really nice picture that I found, but it really highlights something that even today in Mexico is still very common, especially out in the rural areas. Um, something you might notice is, for example, the lack of metal, right, in, in this picture. Um, I, I remember growing up that uh, metal was something that wasn't very often used in the kitchen, right? Because back then, uh, back in the day, you often just used pottery or a volcan volcanic rock. Who here has seen a molcajete? So a molcajete is made from a volcanic rock, it's a mortar. It's still a very traditional uh, way of making salsas in Mexico, guacamole and all these things. These, these are very traditional systems that have been maintained throughout the years. Uh, even a comal, uh, where you make the tortilla, it, it's generally made traditionally from terracotta. The pottery is also made from terracotta. But these traditional ways that have been maintained over the years have started collapsing literally in my lifetime, right? I, I'm 36 years old. I remember being young, the use of metal not being very common. Tortillas were still either handmade or made in a tortilleria, which was a generally a corner store kind of situation where you have a family or maybe a couple of families that are taking corn that comes from fields near their town and then taking that corn and processing it in, in a, through a process called nixamalización. Nixamalización is when you make hominy, basically. You take corn, uh, add slaked lime, limestone, basically, that has been uh, baked in the oven and ground, and that adds calcium, right? It's a process that really allowed for the fortification 
of tortillas, the fortification of corn, to uh, give a, uh, a fundamental source of, uh, of necessary amino acids, but most importantly also calcium. Uh, the tortilla was and remains to a certain degree the principal source of calcium in Mexico and within Mesoamerican communities. This has started to change and has started to change very recently uh, through the rise of the relationship between the United States and Mexico. And the next picture is also very interesting because often that comes down to settlers. So uh, the person here in the picture, uh, who here has heard of uh, President Vicente Fox? So Vicente Fox was uh, greatly uh, recognized in the United States and Mexico for being the first president of Mexico uh, to not be uh, part of the ruling party, the PRI, in about, um, I think, 75 years, something like that. Uh, they used to call the PRI the perfect dictatorship, uh, basically from the Mexican Revolution up until the year 2000, they were in power and they still maintained great control in many parts of the country. But what's interesting about uh, Mr. Fox is that Mr. Fox happens to come from my town. <laughs> uh, his, uh, great, his grandfather, uh, Jose Luis Fuchs came from Cincinnati. He rode a horse from Cincinnati all the way to my town. Uh, he was given or bought it for a very cheap price, a huge plot of land in my town or right outside of my town to essentially have cattle, right? Uh, to take a system, a town that had been traditionally either growing corn, growing beans, growing squash, growing reeds because our town is known for making hats. Uh, to this. So uh, Fox, uh, my grandfather actually used to teach at his uh, ranch and um, it, it was a very interesting dynamic, a, a real meeting of worlds, but something that, that's, that's happening, uh, that happened within our lifetime, right? This collapse of, of these uh, traditional ways. This has been repeated time and time again throughout Mexico, not only in my San Francisco, but in, in almost every single little town in Mexico. Um, and um, it has been accelerated uh, since the creation of NAFTA. Chris mentioned this question of corn, right? Um, corn, as I mentioned, is uh, very important to, to, Mexican, uh, to, to Mexican communities, both here in the United States, but also in Mexico. Uh, corn in particular represents about 60% of the calories that are consumed by uh, the average Mexican, a huge amount of calories, right? Um, and that has led to a collapse of corn. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, it's hard to see here, but who here has heard of Maseca? Maseca is a company, it's a, uh, it's a brand owned by a company called Gruma. Now, Gruma basically perfected the process of dehydrating the dough for making tortillas. So as I said, normally tortillas are made when you take hominy and you grind the hominy. There isn't really ever a process where you actually have flour, or at least there wasn't until very recently. Uh, this company perfected the process of taking this dough, taking this masa, dehydrating it, and then being able to put it in bags. Uh, and it went from having small corner store tortillerias um, even 25 years ago to having these huge factories um, all over Mexico, all over Central America. You actually have some of these now in China, um, which allows the industrialization of essentially a corner uh, uh, industry, a community industry to a very huge level. Now, what's very sad and disappointing about the situation also is that this new process has largely eliminated the calcium from the tortillas, which I'll talk a little bit about later and the implications that that has had for the collapse of the food system. Uh, because now people need to identify a new source of calcium, and who can guess what that new source of calcium is? Dairy. 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 So um, this situation has uh, also impacted immigration. Uh, especially, especially here in San Francisco, um, you probably might know that uh, when immigrants leave a country, they usually tend to follow their relatives, their cousins, their friends to another country. Here in San Francisco, where you have a lot of people uh, coming from is Yucatan. Uh, there's a huge native 
Yucatec native Mayan population in San Francisco. So a lot of these folks are leaving their cornfields, coming to San Francisco, and working in restaurants. If you just stand around 16th and Mission any given day, any given hour, you will often hear Yucatec Mayan being spoken in the streets. Um, I, it, it's heartbreaking to think that these folks have been having systems, ways of feeding themselves, ways of feeding their families for thousands of years, but it's because of NAFTA, it's been because of Gruma, that all of a sudden you have this collapse of their traditional ways of life, forcing them to immigrate. A real vicious cycle that has been created here. Um, and of course, what's also important to mention is that Gruma has uh, decided that a lot of their corn is going to be GM corn, right? Which has created an even more uh, strong initiative, incentive in Mexico to, to stop buying local corn and buy corn from the United States. This situation of settlers has led to this situation, Coca-Cola consumption, dairy consumption. So uh, the one on the right is the consumption of dairy in Mexico, uh, of Coke in Mexico. You can see that huge spike over the last 10 years. And the national production of milk. This is the milk uh, production in Mexico. You can see it's hard to see, but it starts out in 1970. Uh, and you have this huge spike. Again, what's important to highlight is the fact that <laughs> um, the vast majority of Mexicans, particularly rural Mexicans who are of indigenous descent, are lactose intolerant. For them to be consuming a product that is not only very foreign, but ultimately harmful to their systems is incredible. And this is largely due to the initiatives of uh, multinationals. Uh, we'll talk about this later today. Uh, one of my colleagues will be talking about it later today in greater detail. But um, I just want to finish this up with actually a very interesting video. Um, some of you might have seen this already. I'm going to put on the sound. But this was released just a couple of days ago. Um, I re really could not believe it when I saw it. But um, it's an advertisement by Coca-Cola. Uh, with Mijes. Uh, Mije is a traditional, it, it, it's an ethnic group in Oaxaca. Oaxaca is the a, one of the southern states in Mexico, largely indigenous, right? Um, that has been able to avoid a lot of the issues that my San Francisco and other towns throughout central Mexico have dealt with. So I'll leave you to it. could not believe that that made it out of their marketing department, but it, it, it is a perfect example of what native peoples in North America have been going through, uh, packaged in a 2015 format, right? Uh, basically, they're trying to pursue every small community in Mexico that has been able to maintain a certain level of uh, traditional ways of being, of healthy ways of eating, right? And uh, completely destroyed, right? Uh, a, a very interesting um, 
fact uh, is that 13% uh, of Mexicans uh, now have diabetes, right? Uh, that's not only due to the consumption of uh, things like Coca-Cola, but it's also due to things like the consumption of dairy, high fats, uh, high fat food. But ultimately, it's, it's, it's this sort of situation that a lot of native peoples in North America, that a lot of rural Mexicans, that a lot, a lot of rural Americans are dealing with. And ultimately, why it's really important to make sure that we have events like this, that we're talking about the uh, oppression, the capitalist oppression, because it is a capitalist oppression that's happening uh, to, to ensure that, that we can defend ourselves. So um, that's about it for me. Um, do you uh, have any questions? Um, so uh, the video actually, uh, it starts out by talking about the prejudice that native peoples in Mexico suffer. So approximately 10% of Mexicans, uh, actually I should step back. The definition between indigenous peoples in Mexico and the United States are very different. So here in the United States, it's mostly based around what's called blood quantum. So basically establishing whether you had a, uh, a uh, grandfather or a great grandfather, a grandmother, a great grandmother as a native, uh, a recognized native, right? That appears on some sort of role or another. And, and that's enough uh, for you to be a recognized Indian in the United States. Um, and um, in, in Mexico, it's very different. <laughs> if, if we use the standard of blood quanta, I, I, I feel it would be, reasonable to say that about 80, 90% of Mexicans are indigenous, right? Uh, in, in Mexico, it's mostly based around language. That's really the, the principal thing. Uh, if you speak a native language, uh, you're na native, you're indigenous. If you don't speak a native language, you're not. The interesting fact is that that means that if somebody is white and goes out to one of these communities, really lives there, learns that language, they can't start slowly being considered white. Uh, the opposite also happens that when somebody goes there, you, uh, to some of these villages, especially around my area, you sometimes will find native people, indigenous people who are blue-eyed, right? Because they might have some ancestry from Spain or from some other part of the world. A great example of this is, of course, uh, Frida Kahlo. Uh, Frida Kahlo was of uh, uh, Mexic descent and I believe uh, Bulgarian or Hungarian descent but because she grew up with her mother, she was seen as indigenous. Um, so um, in Mexico now, there's about 10% of the population that speaks one of about uh, 30, 35 indigenous languages amongst them, Mije, and they suffer through great discrimination, great racism. And the Coca-Cola ad basically is trying to combat said racism by having uh, a basically a slogan in the Mihil language, in their native language, and that, that's the goal, to, to combat racism uh, through capitalistic imperial oppression. Can, can you just, um, for those who didn't read what it said, mm -hmm. it was profoundly patriarchal, and also um, um, some of what it said was like, a, now you're united with North America. Now you're part of North America because you're rotting your teeth and ruining your health. And, exactly. and by the way, the, 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 the uh, phosphorus in mm -hmm. those soft drinks eliminate calcium absorption exactly. even further. Exactly. And calcium, uh, calcium, adequate calcium is linked with diabetes as well. Absolutely. Um, can I just ask one thing? I know Please. in other parts of the world, the ownership or the attempted takeover of water supplies by the Coca-Cola company has forced people to, to buy soft drinks or bottled water. Is that the case in some of these communities as well, or is it purely buy the sugary drink and get addicted to it? it it's a little bit of both. Uh, so I can tell you that uh, my parents moved back to, to uh, my town about eight years ago. Um, Despite the fact that uh, there's a significant amount of investment by the Mexican federal government in water treatment plants, and, and you generally have potable drinking water, 
in many small, medium, and large towns in Mexico, it might not taste great, but it's drinkable, right? There's this uh, 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 taboo about drinking tap water, no matter how clean it is, right? And this has largely been due to companies like Coca-Cola and Nestle. And these companies have really fomented and encouraged a system where everybody drinks bottled water all the time. Even if you just buy those big jugs, you're always drinking that. And when you're outside, you just drink soft drinks, right? Uh, and and um, that's led to, to this idea that it only it, if it comes out of a labeled package is it water, is it drinkable, right? And um, of course that has meant that um, there's been a uh, de-investment from improving our water systems, from improving access to water, to clean water in, in smaller towns, right? A, a very uh, uh, slippery slope sort of situation because it means now that um, if you're uh, lower income, if you're poor in Mexican and can't afford these things, you end up in, in, in a catch-22 sort of situation where you don't want to drink the water, but you have to. So you end up spending a significant amount of your income just to get something that should be free, right? Or at least not going to Coca-Cola or Nestle. But so far the water supplies themselves are not pr pr proprietary, as far as you know. It, it, it depends on the area. It depends on the area. Uh, like California, huge parts of Mexico have been going through a drought, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that means that there has been an increase in the cost of the bottled water, an increase in the cost of uh, soft drinks, right? But it, it's, it also has just meant that there's been more export from areas that happen to have water towards the rest of the country. Uh, everything, of course, being driven by these uh, multinationals. Talk a little about resistance movements in Mexico to this uh, whole push. Uh, I don't know if it's um, you know related all to the resistance in Chiapas or other mm -hmm. parts of Mexico. Are there groups that are uh, mobilizing? Yeah, um, there's a long history of resistance, and in, in fact, actually, my town. Um, so the Mexican. Uh, War of Independence from Spain started in my state in Guanajuato. Um, a, uh, the first rebellion that actually led, surprisingly enough, and a lot of folks don't realize that this San Francisco, California, received its independence from Spain at the same time as the rest of Mexico. So uh, the uh, Grito de Dolores um, on the 16th of September of uh, 1810 liberated this San Francisco as well. Right, that was preceded by a series of Indian rebellions in my state, uh, most famously in my town, uh, where uh, about uh, 20 years before uh, the Grito de Dolores in 1810, uh, was successful in expelling uh, colonial and royal forces from my town, the, uh, the sheriffs, I guess. Right, uh, that has led to a history of, of rebellions that has been more or less constant since uh, the late 1700s in Mexico, and I'm sure before, but documentable, right, since the 1700s. Uh, that led to, of course, the rebellion of the Zapatistas in, uh, 19, in the 1910s. And uh, throughout the 1970s and 1960s, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of push from, um, from essentially Marxist or communist forces in, in uh, southern Mexico around uh, the system of oppression, what they were seeing as uh, a destruction of their traditional ways of life, culminating in the uh, 80s, in the late 80s, with the creation of the uh, Zapatistas in Chiapas, right? Uh, what's interesting about that process is that Zapatismo was um, fundamentally central Mexican, right? Uh, it was uh, Emiliano Zapata came from a uh, central state in Mexico called Morelos, uh, he was a Nahuatl speaker, the same language that the Aztecs spoke. And he was very successful in doing that. Uh, but the Zapatistas that we know today are actually Mayan speakers from even farther south in Mexico, right? Uh, so, so they adopted this, uh, what, what was uh, the way Zapata referred to the revolution was uh, a, a, a constant struggle 
for uh, demanding social justice, basically. So uh, they adopted that concept in, in southern Mexico, uh, and uh, that, that's where you have a lot of this pressure, right? The, this uh, seeking autonomy, seeking uh, separation from the oppressive systems of both the state and also the, the multinationals, leading to um, uh, improve the situation of all native folks, and, and also uh, mixed people in Mexico. Ultimately, there isn't such a huge gap between the indigenous and the uh, mestizos, culturally speaking, right? So that's led to uh, the Zapatistas, a few other groups that have taken both uh, armed and non-armed rebellion in different parts of Mexico. Uh, what's also very interesting, and, and um, it's, it's a bit controversial here in the United States, but there has been a big push to uh, remove oneself from the political system. In, in Mexico. So what that means is essentially a, a push to no longer uh, vote, to no longer participate in a system that is deemed to be inherently corrupt. So uh, most controversially in the uh, 2006 elections, uh, the Zapatistas actually said, called uh, for a, a voto nulo, so essentially casting a blank ballot, right, which actually led to about 25% of Mexicans going to the ballot box, but not voting for anybody. And that as a way of protesting that system and how oppressive it is and how irrelevant it is to people's lives, right? So, so there's a lot of uh, active rebellion, uh, passive rebellion going on in Mexico, a uh, huge mistrust for the uh, government and a huge, and an even bigger mistrust for multinationals. But like I said earlier, there's very limited ways of removing yourself from that in, in the current system unless you're fortunate enough to live in a place like um, Chiapas, the, the autonomous communities over there. Any other questions? Yes? I, I wonder if um, you have information about the, the uh, massive strike in Baja, California of the, um, of the agricultural workers there. Apparently it was a successful strike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can give a little bit of background of what's been happening in Baja. Um, I don't know the specifics about what's been going on recently, but um, a as I mentioned, there, there was the Zapatista Rebellion, uh, a largely indigenous uprising uh, about 100 years ago, right? Emiliano Zapata most famously led this whole process. Uh, it was a largely anti-authoritarian uh, rebellion. So what I mean by that is that um, when the Bolsheviks in Russia were explicitly Marxist or Leninist, or, or when other folks in Europe were espousing socialism or even anarchism as a way of achieving social justice, in the case of Mexico, it was largely indigenous, largely authoritarian. Very famously, Emiliano Zapata was asked uh, by a reporter if he was a socialist or if he was an anarchist, and he said, I don't really know what that means. He was giving a summary of what it meant, and he said, well, if somebody tries to take my land, I'm gonna shoot them. <laughs> so he wasn't obviously a communist. And, and so he said, by process of elimination, that would make me an anarchist, an anti-authoritarian. In the case of Baja, Baja has, uh, a little bit like Alaska, been always separated from the rest of Mexico. Uh, it, it, it's been, uh, largely autonomous, it was the last territory in Mexico, the last part to become an official state. And it also made, made it very easy for uh, some of the more uh, radical currents of political thought in Mexico to make their way over there. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the, the Mexican re revolutionary uh, uh, Flores Magón, the Flores Magón brothers uh, of that time, they actually went to California, to Baja, they went to La Paz, and, and basically created a system of communes very similar to what's going on in Chiapas now. They injected a strong sense of autonomy in uh, the rural workers and the, the urban workers over there, right? So um, the last time I went, it was very interesting because the rhetoric is, is almost straight out of uh, late 1800s Europe, right? And, and, an explicitly anti-authoritarian, explicitly anarchist, 
very similar to what the industrial workers of the world here in the United States were talking about. So um, I, I presume that a lot of the connection that's happening today finds its, its um, catalyst in, in this political struggle that has been going on in Baja, uh, just down the street actually, um, from, from here. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, is everybody else done? Mm -hmm. um, just want to ask what the role, uh, briefly, of Pemex has been in all of this yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, Mexico is one of the largest producers of petroleum in the United States, in, in the world, in the United States. Um, it almost feels like that sometimes, but um, in, in the world, uh, it um, controversially is also has it also has a nationalized petroleum industry, uh, very corrupt, very inefficient, and has been seen essentially as a way of uh, getting kickbacks if you happen to work for the government for um, a very long time. Right. Um, with the advent of neoliberalism in the um, mid '90s, early '90s, right, uh, there was there has been this huge drive to uh, um, privatize some of these systems, right? So basically, taking the corruption to the next level, right? Allowing and making sure that some of these uh, pieces of infrastructure, particularly, become uh, privatized in the hands uh, of bigger multinationals. So what you're having now is refineries being sold off, uh, refineries being exported out to the United States. So essentially what happens is that Mexico uh, drills for the oil, packages it, sends it to the United States. The United States does the refinement and exports back gasoline to Mexico and diesel fuel to Mexico. Right. So it's no longer autonomous, it's no longer sovereign even in terms of the energy that it's producing, uh, which to me, it just creates a, a stronger relationship culturally and economically between the United States and Mexico. Whatever happens here now impacts us over there much more strongly, again, driving to things like more and more immigration, more and more displacement of people there, and of course, of people here in the United States. So, any other questions? So I, I, I did want to mention, so as Sarita mentioned, uh, our, the other panelist who was uh, supposed to join us, uh, Claudia Serrato, was unable to make it. But um, I did want to uh, let folks know that um, her website talks about a lot of the similar things that I am talking about. Uh, she is uh, from LA. Uh, I'll put up the website. Um, talks about indigenous veganism, so uh, much more explicit uh, and much more recent perspectives. So, claudiaserrato.tumblr.com. Uh, she talks a lot about uh, this question of cultural relevance and, and keeping culturally uh, important traditions alive, right? From the perspective of food justice, from the perspective of food sovereignty, and from the perspective of Mesoamerican and indigenous worldviews. So uh, if you have an opportunity, please check out uh, the, the website, and uh, we hope to have an event with her uh, over the next few months to make up for this. Thank you. Mm.